Hello and welcome to our webinar event tonight, hosted by Western Watersheds Project entitled Death by a Million Hooves, Failing Our Public Lands. My name is Adam Bronstein, your host for this evening. I am the Oregon Nevada Director with Western Watersheds Project. I am presenting from my home in Central Oregon, the traditional lands of the Tonino and the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs, Siletz, and Grand Ronde. Tonight, we will be exploring the Bureau of Land Management's land health standard practices, national policy implications, and agency failures to adequately address issues on the ground where ecological function and sensitive wildlife resources have been compromised. Land health standards are a set of protocols for measuring and documenting the health of riparian areas, flora, fauna, and soils on our public lands. Just for context, nearly 50% of Bureau grazing allotments are failing their own standards. Of the lands that are failing to meet standards, the agency found that in 72% of cases, livestock grazing was a causal factor. Land health assessments are often inconsistent across field offices and are conservative in nature. Where grazing allotments are passing health standards, WWP and our allies still document widespread resource damage on the ground. The problem of near ubiquitous livestock grazing impacts that cause the failure of land health standard assessment achievement across entire ecoregions is just too big to ignore. The status quo is clearly not working and changes are needed across the board that must come top down from national and state managers within the Bureau of Land Management. Local politics and corruption prevents the implementation of the changes that are so desperately needed. We have blown past carrying capacity and now we need strong government leadership to put us back on course. So to those who have just joined us, welcome. If you could please stay muted. And I'm just gonna go over the um, question and answer portion of the presentation. So we're gonna work through our panelists. And then if you have questions, if you could type them in the chat, please don't jump in and unmute yourself. It just becomes too unwieldy. And we will get to all of you uh, towards the end. So our first presentation is by Laura Welp, an ecosystem, she's our ecosystem specialist at Western Watersheds Project. And her presentation is titled Rangeland Health Assessments, a case study for Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. So over to you, Laura. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody hear me and see me? Yep, you're doing good, doing great. great. Okay, yeah, hi, thanks. I'm uh, Laura Welp and um, I work for Western Watershed Project now, but I um, used to work for the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in the old days, right around um, um, 2001 was when I got there. And at that time, everybody was, you know, bright and shiny and, you know, new monument and they were writing management, the management plan for it, but they deferred the grazing part of it um, until later. Uh, so we were supposed to have one done by 2003. And uh, what we had to do first, of course, was um, assess the status of the land throughout the monument under the current grazing uh, regime. And we did that by following the BLM's uh, standards for rangeland health that they established in 1994. And that, you know, kind of told us what the minimum standards were for ecosystem functioning on, uh, on the public lands, you know, and what we should be shooting for. And assessing these rangeland uh, health uh, sites was intended to be a required part of the grazing permit renewal process as well. So um, Utah standards and guidelines were developed and uh, they uh, determined that if you knew some information about soils, riparian and wetlands, biotic integrity, which um, usually talks about means vegetation functioning um, and also um, water quality, uh, if those things are doing well, then uh, you've got um, some pretty good rangeland health. But, you know, what do you do, what's the connection between when you're standing on a site and you're looking down and how do you tell, you know, yeah, my upland soils sustain and improve site productivity? Well, you break out your interpreting indicators of rangeland health um, manual. Um, this is a wonderful um, uh, document and it, it was put together by land management agency researchers and other researchers. Um, they wanted to design a protocol that would 
quickly and qualitatively measure the components of range line of health on a site. It's necessarily subjective, um, which is not ideal, but if it's done well, it provides a good snapshot of uh, rangeland health at the time. A really important part of this um, is that you have to have an interdisciplinary team with specialists, uh, with different, um, you know, people who know what they're doing in different uh, uh, disciplines, and particularly the range um, conservationist that's responsible for that allotment, and also for some reason, um, a smoke jumper. I don't know why I put that on there. So the method rests on comparing the ecological site description of the evaluation area with um, the same ecological site uh, in, a, in a reference state. And so an ecological site characterizes what you would expect on the site based on um, soils, uh, geography, um, that, um, vegetation, climate. And some will even, they have a description of what the site will look like under various disturbance regimes, um, usually fire. Uh, or overgrazing, and they also have a description of a reference state where the soils and site stability, the hydrologic function, and the biotic integrity are, um, you know, meeting range we have, performing at near optimum uh, at a, um, a natural disturbance regimes. So what you do is uh, you go out on a site and you look at each of these 18 indicators um, and you compare uh, the site that you're on with the reference state for each of these indicators. So for example, uh, let's say bare ground. Um, you come up with a rating, uh, you know, you look at your, your reference description. It says, um, okay, 10% bare ground is, would be normal for the functioning system. And then you look like on the ground, on the site you're evaluating and you say, oh, I, you know, I have 15 percent bare ground. And so that's, you know, that's pretty close to um, the standard. You know, I'm gonna give this, you know, you give it a five, maybe a four. Um, and, and then so on in the line, if you, you know, say it's got 30% bare ground, it's starting to get further and further away from, um, from the healthy state. So uh, with, you know, experience, um, and sometimes you can do frequency and actually get a number, um, you, you go through and you, and with your, your, your colleagues, um, come up with a number from one to five for each of these indicators. Um, then uh, for each of the soil, hydrology, and biotic indicators, you aggregate those numbers until you come up with one number for the health of each of those three components. And that's how that works. Here's a little bit of a, um, here's some examples. Now on this left side here, uh, we have examples uh, that, of sites that are in good condition, um, reference state or close to it. Um, and on the right is the, what you're comparing it to. So for soil stability, for example, again, we're doing this bare ground, you can look at that and see, wow, it's pretty much covered, even though it says it's slightly less than expected. So maybe we give it a four. And there's quite a bit more bare ground here. It looks like it's more, you know, you have to measure a bit more in the two kind of um, area. Same with hydrologic function. We have a lot of plants on this um, site and it is grabbing all that water that's coming down out of the sky as opposed to this guy right here, where you can just see that water shooting right off. It is not staying on the site, it's not absorbing. Um, and then the uh, biotic integrity, we have sagebush grassland here. It's got, we have native brunch grasses, it's near potential, um, as opposed to um, what we see here when we're comparing this, it's got cheat grass. So that's a pretty big, um, that's a pretty big shift. That site will not do well on the, biotic integrity um, rating. That's um, what, I would, what I would predict. The interesting thing, just as a side, about the training that I took where I learned how to evaluate or to just keep an eye on these different um, components of, of range on health is um, now I can go around and, 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 it, and I pay attention to that stuff. Whereas before, you know, I, I had no idea. I would walk by a site like this and just be, well, it must be normal. That must be what it, um, how it's supposed to be. So um, that, this is actually kind of a problem because um, it, you, you think it's, that's how it's supposed to look even if you've been there well. And so the, a degraded state is the new normal. And we have a shifting baseline where, um, you know, a, a depauperate world is, is, is perfectly fine. We don't even know the difference. So that's what this, this training did for me. It was very beneficial. 
Um, this I uh, wanted to talk about, you know, what soil flexibility really means. It's the capacity of the site to retain soil. So is it is it eroding, basically? Now here we've got these nice biological soil crests, keeping the soil uh, the soil on the site. These are the indicators that we're going to use to decide how well it's doing. Similarly, the hydrologic function, can, can the water stay on the site? Is it soaking it? Is there are plants that are grabbing it and, and making sure um, that it stays there as opposed to what we see here where it's blowing away. And biotic integrity, here's the indicators that, that um, uh, come into uh, determining what that looks like. And I want to point out this functional and structural uh, diversity here. Um, vegetative diversity refers to the different types of plants on a site. Um, so it's like how many different species do you have? Are they sprouting versus non-sprouting? Do you have a wide variety of shrubs, grasses, forbs, you know, bunch grasses versus rhizomatous grasses, uh, annual, perennial, you know, it's really important to have a, a wide variety of plants. Um, it's kind of like um, having the more cards you have in your play in your hand that you're playing, the more options you have to play them, um, and and the better able you are to um, to have to have something that that you can you can um, you know um, respond to disruption like climate change, for example. Whereas if you look at this site right here, it looks like we have about one species. So if something comes along, like say army cutworms or something, takes out the whole thing. You don't have anything else on the keeping the soil on the site, so that is not very healthy. That's what functional and structural diversity means. Um, so let's practice. Here we have a semi-desert loam, Wyoming big sagebrush site. This is in Capitol Reef National Park, so um, we're going to use this as our reference condition. And I just want to draw your attention. We got a, a variety of shrubs here, and um, you can't see them, but we've got um, rice seed, uh, rice grass, and drop seeds. A variety of, of native variety of plants. So we're going to use this to see it to go west a little bit down the road to the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument and use this as a, a reference site for that. Okay, here's our evaluation site. So first of all, um, you can see it's pretty evident. This, these look like uh, grasses, but they're actually uh, tumble mustard. And the other things that we have in this area are um, cheatgrass and Russian thistle, pretty much. Then we have a lot of bare ground and a lot of erosion. So what we're looking at is quite a bit of departure from the reference condition. This site was rated like twos, maybe even ones in, in, in places. Um, and this is where, whoops, this is where it's important um, to know the history of a site. This is a seeding. It's probably been seeding at this point in 2002. It's been seeded at least twice, probably with uh, um, a monoculture of non-native uh, forage grasses. Um, and so what happens when you have a monoculture like this and um, you, a drought comes along, 2002, it was terrible drought. Everything dies all at once. And then every, uh, so, you know, the site is completely bare. Plus there is a history of trespass on this site too. So um, that is, um, that, that's sort of how you, a virtual way of assessing these, these conditions. We have something similar for, uh, to assess lentic areas if there are spring, or I mean, uh, yeah, springs um, and like ponds and stuff. And then we also have one for Lodic areas, that's, you know, your riparian areas. So, so now that we have all of our, you know, trainings and things that we know what to look for, we selected our sites and um, we evaluate what sites, ecological sites in the dominant ecological, ecological site types in each pasture in all the allotments. So it was very intensive. Um, we looked at three, 628 upland sites, 505. Um, uh, wetland sites. So what did we see? Okay, 71% of the all the upland sites are functioning, five are not, and 24% are, are in the middle. They're in that three zone where it's, they're kind of tipping, um, you know, they're balanced. And if, if uh, one wrong thing happens, they could be, um, you know, are at risk of degradation um, going down towards those ones and twos. Um, and so if you look at those things and you pay attention to them, you can do management that will tip them back up closer toward that 
that reference site or at least keep them at three. Now the main vegetation uh, types that were at risk were sagebrush grasslands, seedings, which are often in sagebrush grassland, and wetlands. So we'll take those one at a time, and I guess I screwed that up. Um, so we did 203 sage, uh, big sagebrush evaluations. 50% uh, of them were functioning, so that's like they were fours or fives. 40% um, were functioning at risk, 10% were non-functioning at all. And that is, um, it's kind of high, but it's not as high as seedings, where um, the functioning at risk and non-functioning sites were more than the functioning sites. So how to take a look at seeding and what is going on there. Uh, compare that to pinion juniper woodland ecological site types. Um, this is the most common type on the monument and it is doing beautifully. There's just, you know, hardly anything wrong uh, with it at all. So why, it begs the question, how, what is the deal with um, sagebrush grassland types? What, um, how come they have such poor rangeland health scores? Well, let's see if I can make this work. The guy who designed this study, this rangeland health assessment, um, did a, uh, put together a publication on it. And he speculates that the reason why we have such a hard time, sagebrush grassland has such a hard time, is that they actually contain um, some of the most palatable forages. They have grass, you know, uh, it's pinion juniper. Um, many of those sites don't have that much grass. Um, so, you know, that really attracts a lot of the grazing animals, livestock and wildlife. So they're trampling on that and it gets a lot of use. And so we, we uh, our soil and hydrology indicators tend to decline. Um, and unpalatable woody plants, like, you know, the, the shrubs increase um, because they have been released from competition from the herbaceous species. And, um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, if there's fire suppression, then that doesn't knock the woody plants back. Uh, and so they increase for that reason at all. Climate change is another in, uh, reason that some people cite. Also on the monument, um, back in the past, they would put tr um, treatments just about anywhere they wanted more grass. And sometimes they would do it at inappropriate, you know, very sensitive, fragile soils. And those, um, the damage from that has not been, um, not, they have not recovered. They're still, they're still pretty bad. So wetland results um, were kind of concerning. 37% um, of the streams and 30% of the springs were properly functioning, which means all of the rest were not. So, I mean, almost 50% of the springs are, were at risk of further degradation. That is not really um, surprising when you think about how um, much like diversions for agriculture have been done. Wells, you know, pumped for wildlife. Um, you know, troughs. It takes a lot of the water out of the spring. And up until recently, they were not even leaving any in the spring to maintain riparian vegetation. So what happens after you get all of that results? So then the next step is evaluations and determinations. So the evaluation process is the first part. Um, everybody gets, a, um, you know, sits down around the table and you evaluate for each allotment, whether they it met standards, rangeland health standards or not. Um, and this can be, this can be a, um, a fraught process because, you know, it's kind of a report card for how well everybody's been done, you know, managing particularly for the range person um, who's in charge of that uh, allotment. And once you, um, you know, you go through, you say yes, no. If you determine, yeah, this allotment did not meet rangeland health standards, the next thing to do um, is determine whether it was due to livestock grazing or not. And that's when the knives really come out. Um, so uh, let's see if I can make this. Work. Yeah, so we, we did 84 allotments. We assessed 84 allotments. Um, 63 of those were, were meeting, 21 were not. And of that 21, 19, failed due to livestock management. And actually the other two, they said um, that were in bad condition because of livestock, but they had changed management. It just had not recovered yet. So, so if you have an allotment and it does not meet rangeland health standards because of livestock, that kicks in this um, provision in BLM manual uh, like 48, 4180. 
Um, it, so it feels existing livestock grazing is um, significantly uh, a reason behind not achieving, then the authorized officer must take appropriate action as soon as practicable, but no later than the beginning of the next grazing year. So, um, oh yeah, so the deal with that is you don't have to do too, very much um, in order to comply with that, you know, just even a, a simple uh, change in the season of use. Um, that sometimes though, uh, some they, it will be an excuse uh, to say, well, we need to put out more waters. If we develop water pump view a well and, and pipelines, then we'll spread out the impacts and that will result in increased rangeland health. It usually doesn't though, in practice, it just adds one more you know, degraded spot around um, a water source. And uh, sometimes you, there it's even an ex used um, as an excuse for seedings. Um, so, nonetheless, I mean, the monument had to do something on these 19 allotments, and they didn't. And my um, colleague, Jonathan Ratner, very smart guy, noticed that they had not done anything, so they, they failed to come up to comply. And he, so he thought, you know, litigation's the only way we're going to get them to fix this. And so he filed suit, um, but he, it was, um, we had to do, oh, I didn't change it. Um, it, it, it was a conservative judge in the conservative 10th Circuit Court, and he dismissed the case. He said he had no subject matter jurisdiction. Um, he didn't have the authority to hear it, which was a very weird um, thing to argue. Our lawyer said, that's weird. And we could appeal this and we could win. But, um, you know, we would just, you know, have it would be remanded back to the same judge. So, you know, and it wouldn't lead to concrete on the ground benefits for ecosystem health. So we just um, decided not to, not to pursue that, um, at least in that case. So uh, my final thoughts were, um, you know, why are our public lands failing? You know, we have all the information we need. We have tools to assess, you know, the landscape health conditions. We know what we need to do to improve them. BLM has policies and regulations that would improve conditions if they were followed. We have MPs for each allotment and the BLM has the authority to make those changes. They, they don't do it. And we all know it's political pressure from politicians and ranchers allows BLM to escape its responsibility and the, lo the local elites get their way. The American people are given short shrift on their own public lands. Um, oh, you know, postscript, we started a slideshow saying, you know, we were gonna get information to write a grazing um, management plan. Well, that we never did. <laughs> there were drafts that were set up, but um, the monument managers figured out that if they did not put out another grazing management plan, they could continue to graze under the old plans, which would much more, um, you know, much more open and much more, much more, you know, less protective. So um, they, we did, the monument did not get a management plan until 2018. So it's like 15 years after they were supposed to have come up with one. And that was when Donald Trump you know, changed the boundaries. They issued a new management plan very quickly with a grazing management in there that was um, pretty, pretty less safe there. And now that we have a, new, a Biden administration and they're coming up with another MMP, uh, one of the local elites in uh, Kanab um, at a public meeting told the monument manager that she should just, you know, hold her horses, drag her feet, don't come up with a new management plan for, you know, um, especially for grazing until um, uh, the management, the uh, administration could change and uh, she wouldn't have to, she wouldn't need, she could just, everybody could keep on going the way that they were. Um, so, oh, here's all these little things that I, should have. Okay, how can we change that? And you see on this slide, I've run out of room, so I don't have any answers to that, but I'm sure that Peter and Josh do. So I'm looking forward to seeing that presentation. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Laura. That was great. So next we have Peter Latin, environmental scientist, landscape ecologist. His presentation is titled BLM's Rangeland Health Records, a snapshot of the significance of livestock grazing on public lands. Over to you, Pete. 
just going to share a screen. We're also on mute, Pete. We'll unmute here and screen. Let's see. Looking for does hmm. this join? Can you see my screen? No. Okay. Um. Hold um, right there. Okay. Now, does that? Um, yep. Is that good to go. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, um, my, I, I guess this is the logical progression from on the ground, um, details up to landscape level um, assessments and what uh, collectively do these land health uh, assessments and evaluations uh, show us? And that um, has uh, been, well, we're gonna be looking at, um, at livestock grazing as an ecosystem stressor and disturbance factor and see whether or not we might be able to mine uh, these data to gauge uh, the relative significant and extent of livestock grazing, at least as reported in the records um, that are uh, distilled down from those um, that uh, in the reports that that uh, Laura described. Um, as I completely concur that the avoid uh, the avoidance of hard truth um, is um, is an issue. Um, it's one of the few livestock grazing is one of the few um, disturbance factors under the agency's direct control, um, and. Uh, a number of years ago, the agency started pivoting from uh, a management at the pasture and allotment scale uh, to the watershed and landscape scale. And one of the, the first of the landscape initiatives that um, uh, the agency shifted towards and initiated was the, um, the, were the rapid eco-regional assessments. And in this case, uh, the intent was to be able to use data on um, the, uh, the factors, uh, significant factors impacting resources of conservation concern. And missing among the many uh, was uh, livestock grazing. And so these assessments were being conducted at level three ecoregions. And um, although um, the official reason was lack of data, um, rangeland health data and condition data. Um, there was also a discussion about the, the um, uh, concerns both by stakeholders as well as the Washington office um, regarding potentials for litigation. Uh, this, I will not go through this again. You know, what's it all about? Well, it's crunching all of this uh, down into something that um, can be used um, at broad spatial scales to take a look. Um, now here, this is just a, a picture of a statement of work uh, for uh, one of the first of the uh, rapid eco-regional assessments that I was involved in um, and uh, 59 pages and not one reference to livestock grazing, uh, livestock or grazing. Um, the, one of the, uh, a report uh, um, 
assessing the uh, condition of, of uh, rangelands uh, in 2011 um, in order to fulfill uh, Congress's direction in, in FLIPMA um, and the Public Rangeland Improvements Act to periodically and systematically inventory the public rangelands and identifying both current conditions and report that information to Congress and the public. 96 pages, reference to livestock grazing, zero. So um, I decided uh, that um, compiling these data and uh, converting them to geospatial format so that we could get a broad scale picture of uh, livestock grazing as a reported disturbance factor is a significant cause of failure to achieve rangeland health um, was uh, important. And I uh, decided to take on that the onerous task. Um, the, these data, they did exist, uh, but they were in, in, uh, in pretty rough uh, uh, shape. There were only, there were at that point data only through about 2000. Uh, eight, I believe. So um, what I have just recently finished was uh, working with PEER is to compile 23 years worth of uh, land health standards evaluations um, 20, 21,000 uh, grazing allotments. Uh, the agency had never compiled these, stored them electronically, and all the data that exists um, was the res uh, in response to Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, the first of which was actually um, requested by Jonathan Ratner uh, back in 2008. And so um, we have um, so the, the challenge was to uh, compile these data and and to see whether or not they might be um, or have utility across broad spatial scales, but also um, to determine uh, whether or not this is something that the agency could take on themselves and compile in a much more detailed and less um, uh, error prone uh, data set. So we have 155 million acres of 21,000 allotments uh, with, we requested these data three times each time they were compiled from scratch by the field offices, uh, mostly off of paper records. So collectively, um, I had uh, 75,000 records um, in my hands, and these were all submitted in spreadsheet form um, as a data dump. And none of them had received any uh, scrutiny at the state level to determine whether or not um, all the uh, everything was filled in, whether or not uh, uh, there, there was uh, sufficient um, detail in the records to be of utility. And uh, often these, uh, this resulted in both conflicting information, errors and omissions within a data set for any specific land health um, evaluation, uh, but also between uh, the data sets, which made uh, the merging of these data um, quite challenging. And so I merged all these records and cleaned them up as best as possible. Uh, having those three, uh, three versions of it allowed me to fill in gaps where there were omissions and, um, and examine um, in, uh, cases where there might be conflicting information. So for example, an allotment might be identified as meeting standards, uh, but in the, uh, they might have a causal determination uh, information suggesting that it, the, um, or indicating that it, um, livestock were a cause of failure to meet standards. So these required uh, uh, correcting. And between records, sometimes where there had been um, the, <clears throat> a, a different transcription between one, uh, one of the data sets we received and another, um, an early version might have identified livestock as a causal factor for failure, um, but the more recent one received uh, dropped livestock grazing, whether by accident or, um, in some cases, we actually, in the most recent one, um, it, the received a record that was that identified a, not the most current record, but one 
that have been um, from, for a, the previous uh, land health evaluation. So in, recon in reconciling all these data, I used a standardized protocol and uh, this USGS took a peek at the first data set, the, um, the, uh, this will go into later, uh, the, the one that uh, Jonathan Ratner obtained. And so I followed along the lines uh, the, of the uh, merging techniques and sorting that they did. I mean, I've, I've moved upon that. So the objective was to take all these 75,000 records and put them in geospatial format. So we can begin to look and see what, what we can see and, and whether or not these data would, would uh, uh, suggest that there are any regional differences, eco-regional differences um, in vulnerability uh, to the impacts of livestock grazing. And so in, in this, this just um, shows uh, the general you know, from, from hard copy records to um, uh, the mapping, in this case, it's records through the end of 2019 um, and into um, a, uh, an assessment of the, the proportion of area in allotments failing due to livestock of the area currently assessed. And those um, in, in level three ecoregions and the warmer colors reflect um, higher levels of, of um, uh, so a livestock grade or area that was identified as failing due to livestock. So this just is an illustration. Um, we took uh, the various standards that have been nuanced by states or sometimes within the states and collapsed them either into all standards met or not met and then identifying as a required um, uh, livestock as a causal factor if livestock were identified, um, uh, not met, but where livestock were explicitly um, not um, uh, a causal factor. And then we had some that just had indicators. They identified that they have not been achieved. They have gave descriptions, but no, call, no causal factor. And then finally, um, the remainder fell into a determination, not complete status. So this is the general process. Um, the warmer colors, and in this case, the final, um, the final. Uh, let's see if you can see here. The these um, these uh, ecoregions, including the Wyoming Basin, and the Central Basin and Range, Northern Basin and Range, Snake River Plain, and the um, in parts of Eastern Oregon and up into the, the Western Cordillera, all had very high rates of failure due to livestock grazing. Whereas those in um, the plain states, for example, had very low levels of uh, um, uh, failure due to grazing, although there are other reasons potentially for that. And, um, by and large, the fact that most of those are in um, custodial status, having less than 10% of the forage available on public lands, and so in the maps, um, this map, for example, it looks all green as having very low uh, or having met standards, but in reality, um, break, uh, zoom in close and you'll see that, that uh, those are primarily private lands. And they're small enough that they're really, these assessments were really not being conducted at an appropriate spatial scale and more in a checkerboard fashion. So it's hard and we'll get to that in a minute, but to, to determine how they could conclude that an allotment would achieve standards when in many cases, clearly they do not. So um, just as a reality check, I took the 2008 data set that was examined by uh, USGS and then um, performed the same uh, calculations. They had much less data at that point in time you have 12, or 12 years more, but the general picture remains the same. Those ecoregions that are, have the highest failure rates are consistent. And, um, and uh, it's important to note too that all, most of these ecoregions fall into the, a larger you know, level two ecoregion, the, the cold deserts. And they tend to be very uh, 
sensitive soils and bunch grass and are more susceptible to disturbance. So then the objective um, would, was to be able to see whether or not these, these data might be used uh, for uh, in practice um, across broad spatial scales. And in this case, here's a, just a draping over of, of, the, um, uh, of the, the data on top of um, the uh, sage grouse um, distribution. Um, and this is actually an older map, but to give you the, a, a sense of how these data were intended to be used, um, if, they, if they proved to have some utility at all. Um, up in this corner is, a, is an example of, uh, from, the, from the 10,000 foot perspective, uh, private land adjacent to uh, BLM allotment. Um, clearly, uh, it, this, this allotment was identified as meeting standards, but clearly it's been munched to the ground. So in uh, these early, the first data set posts that, uh, that Jonathan Ratner um, uh, requested was examined by USGS and was used in this, uh, um, and the an assessment of the, the impact of livestock grazing at the scale of uh, important habitat within the, the range of the sage grouse. So the, the, um, in this document, they show the various threats, uh, anthropogenic disturbance factors um, associated with, um, with these, um, with a range, everything from oil and gas development uh, to um, wildfire spread of cheatgrass, et cetera. But importantly, livestock grazing was, was treated as a disturbance factor restricted to just those allotments that had been assessed by 2000, in this case, 2007 data, and specifically identified livestock grazing um, as, a, as a cause of failure and specifically identified a failure of a, wild, a wildlife habitat standard. Well, that is a very small subset of, of failures. Um, and most, uh, most of the failures due to livestock grazing don't even identify a standard in these data. What they did in this also was summarize a direct footprint of the disturbance uh, in acres and uh, in both the, the primary habitat as well as the general habitat or priority habitat and general habitat. And I've just flagged some, some um, in various management zones here. And these, th these are huge, hugely underestimated. They used, uh, in the case of wild horse and burrow, um, they used the entire herd management area as the area of uh, disturbance as the footprint. Whereas in this case, even though we have 100 and 55 million acres of public land you know, in allotments, they used a, a fraction of that and just a very small subset of those specifically failing livestock or, uh, livestock um, um, impacts on, on um, habitat. So harnessing the data that, that uh, we have compiled here, just looking at, in this case, an example in Nevada, so these, um, these uh, in red on the right are allotments that have failed and where they've identified livestock grazing as a causal factor, uh, draped over both the uh, sagebrush focal areas, the primary habitat management areas and general habitat management areas. And you can see that there's a sizable chunk right now just there um, in existing, in existing uh, uh, identified um, uh, uh, allotments, ones that have been assessed, but in Nevada, um, 43% have yet to be assessed. Taking, standing back and looking at the picture that I showed before, based on ecoregions, that this re reflects um, uh, an, an ecoregion, or two ecoregions, in this case, the central basin and range, um, down in, the, in this uh, central part, and then the northern basin and range. Um, and this this area has, let's see, I believe a a, a livestock failure um, of about um, a push, pushing seventy percent. I think it's sixty eight percent of the area assessed to date 
or within allotments spilling into livestock grazing impacts. So the question is, um, when the remainder of these of these allotments have been assessed, or if they were all to be assessed today, just what fraction would fall into those areas that would fail and identify livestock grazing as a cause of, uh, or one cause of failure. And I would suggest probably most. So here is a, um, a comparison again of the, the picture across the country um, with sage grouse habitat and the, um, in the, the previous report, um, here's the picture of the vulnerability in just those cold desert ecoregions in the Western Cordillera um, with, with, uh, with levels of failure exceeding 40% of the assessed lands, um, and 40% associated with livestock grazing. And there it is superimposed on top of, of um, current habitat and a very sizable chunk um, of the uh, greater sage grouse occupied habitat in, in uh, four out of the seven management zones falls into areas that, uh, that uh, are at risk of a high, high level of vulnerability to um, uh, disturbance by last night. And then um, I just uh, took as an example, um, lest we consider all these things as hard and fast, um, a study that was done, Dahlgren um, et al. Um, in rangeland ecology and management, that uh, looked at uh, some um, uh, looked at uh, um, uh, lex in um, in an area that was being managed by the um, Desiree. Um, uh, uh, Desiree uh, Livestock um, Company, I believe. And it just so happens when I saw that, hmm, well, that rings a bell. <laughs> and because I had been looking at this several years ago, I think back in 2014, not their property in, uh, specifically, but an allotment. Um, in this case, it's in categorical status and has um, ha is identified uh, as uh, meeting all standards. Um, a very small area on the border of, of Utah and Wyoming in the Wyoming Basin. And um, lest we, we find, we, we, uh, um, we give too much credence to some of these, uh, some of these uh, outcomes, here's a picture of it. And this picture was acquired in 2014 and four months later, the determination was made that all standards all standards were met in um, in this allotment, and this is a typical picture throughout this allotment. And this, hey Peter, uh, Peter, I'm yes. about to interrupt you. We're we're just about out of time, so if you could wrap okay. it up soon, thank you. Okay, yeah, so th th this uh, I I strongly recommend that if there were if we're going to make any headway in the future, um, we there's too much land left un unassessed. The, the ones in, uh, that have been assessed um, are often de a decade or more old. And so remote sensing and rap a rapid um, air photo interpretation to at least identify the low hanging fruit is critical and is very, very um, feasible. And we've, we've brought that to the attention of, 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 um, of BLM and uh, hopefully they'll be able to um, implement something like this because at least they can identify those where no assessment on the ground is necessary. The data also can have been used and can be used for looking at the issues related to, for example, um, uh, the wild horse and burrow and, and or uh, livestock as a cause for um, allotment failure within herd management areas. And just to kind of put a plug in all these um, up, uh, Peer now has a portal that I put together for them that has all these data for exploration. And the, uh, it's in essence a uh, both exploratory tool, but also has GIS capabilities and allows you to query both within layers and between layers. And there's uh, both all the records, all the uh, causal information um, in those records uh, within those three data sets for all assessments conducted to date and uh, against uh, numerous other very um, useful data layers. 
And all the data can be exported either as GS, GIS files, spreadsheets, or can be um, uh, as uh, KML files to look at in, the, um, in Google Earth, which allows you then to really zoom in, see much, uh, also look at historical imagery as well and fly through the landscape. It's very, um, very useful. In this case, I've included a slider so you can peek in underneath the, the information and um, be able to drill down and look at the imagery, change base, base maps. Um, there are various query tools and all. And on the website, the peer website, there's there's a, a how-to manuals to um, to allow folks to, to walk. All right, thank, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. You betcha. Uh, if people want have more questions for Pete, we can get you his email. And um, it, this is just an incredible analysis and we're so thankful and thanks for meeting with uh, the state director in Nevada with me yesterday, Pete, really appreciate it. So next up we have Josh Osher as Western Watersheds Project's Public Policy Director and his presentation is titled, The Policy and Politics of Rangeland Health, How to Reform the BLM's Range Program and Restore Public Lands, over to you, Josh. Great, thanks, Adam, and thanks, Peter and Laura, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. All right, is that working for everybody? Great. Yep. Um, and I apologize for any background noise. My office is a yurt, and it's raining, which sometimes makes it loud in the background. So hopefully, that won't get disturbing. Um, so yeah, um, the, pol the policy and politics of rangeland health. Um, are what I'm going to cover here, and and I'm going to, you know, so Laura brought us down to the to the on the ground level doing the assessments. Peter showed us the aggregation of all the data, and and pointed out kind of the big picture of of how bad things are out there, and and then even how unreliable some of the information is, and and where we need to look next. I'm going to take us out to another level and look at. You know, the, the bigger picture of how rangeland, uh, so-called rangeland is managed in the United States as a result of policy and politics. Um, and I'm gonna go through a little bit of a historical overview um, kind of quickly and then get to kind of the more recent um, rangeland, um, like where we actually get to rangeland health standards and then talk about a little bit why that's, why that's not achieving the goals we want to and, and what we need to do to, uh, to try and improve things on the ground and, and in our policies. So, you know, our, I'm starting here in 1934 with the Taylor Grazing Act, the passage of the Taylor Grazing Act, but really this story goes back a lot further to the passage of the Homestead Act in 1862, which allowed for settlement of Western lands and basically just created a free-for-all where uh, indigenous people were, were wiped out and moved off of the lands, cattle ranchers and sheep ranchers took over and occupied nearly all of these, of these Western lands, um, which began you know, as their private property in a lot of cases. They were, they were just given the lands, 160 acres here or there, and they aggregated them. Um, but um, in the end, what happened is, is, um, is we got these types of conditions you can see in the pictures. We got a lot of drought in, um, in a couple different periods of time. And, um, and by the 19, early 1930s and 19, late 1920s, we had the Dust Bowl. I mean, these lands all the way further east as well um, were just grazed down to the dirt. And, um, and the dust was swirling in Washington, DC. And that's what made people finally take notice is, is when it got dusty in DC, they were like, oh, we got to do something about this. Um, so, you know, in 1934, after a lot of confrontation with the cattle barons and the sheep barons of the West, um, we, we got the passage of the Taylor Grazing Act, which is purpose was to stop the injury to public lands by preventing overgrazing and soil deterioration. Um, and to stabilize the livestock industry in the West because there was a lot of battles over the lands too at the time when it was all open range. Um, this is when we had the cattle and sheep wars. Um, and, uh, and so it was the wild West for a time period there. Um, 
Let's see here. Okay, there. So Taylor Grazing Act passed. Um, the Taylor Grazing Act was, was supposed to like create permits and allotments, um, set up grazing districts and, uh, and allow for a fee to be charged. Um, unfortunately, what happened though, is that the, uh, it also set up these uh, grazing advisory panels and basically they were just stocked with the ranchers. So the reason the ranchers agreed to the Taylor Grazing Act is because they knew they'd get to control it. And sure enough, they, they had complete domination over these, over these panels, determined which lands were suitable for grazing. So today they call that, or in 1934, they said, um, um, was it uh, chiefly valuable for grazing? That's how these lands were characterized. And it was basically whatever the rancher said was chiefly valuable for grazing, which was all of it, um, more or less. Um, so they had, um, but, but yet still there was problems, right? Like Congress decided they wanted to charge a fee for grazing, um, a nickel, a nickel a AUM, a, which is a cow-calf pair uh, was, the, was what they wanted to raise the fee to. And there was a big uproar and objections from the Western senators and stockmen. And, and they actually um, cut all the funding from what was called the grazing service at the time, got formed out of the Taylor Grazing Act. Um, so, uh, you can see here, um, let's see, what did I say? Yeah, so here's our, our first head of the grazing service, you know, Ferry Carpenter. You know, the choice between moving faster and hammering the ranches unmercifully or going slower and continuing to hammer the public domain. Well, as the public domain range is less articulate than the stockmen, we've chosen to hammer the public domain. Um, I think that that statement still applies and nothing has really changed um, since since the 1930s when, when Ferry said this. Um, but the grazing service, in fact, um, ended uh, shortly after its beginning, uh, 10 years later, because of this battle in Congress and, uh, and underfunding. Whoops, wrong direction here. There we go. You know, despite this idea that, that we put in the Taylor Grazing Act to stop the erosion and, and prevent these lands from being degraded by over, over grazing, you know, really no progress was being made. Um, you know, 2% of the usable range area is free from erosion. That's astounding. I mean, considering it was basically all of the West, um, you know, was suffering from this massive erosion. And kind of a prophetic statement here, you know, if if a, unless a scientific range development program was begun, a substantial part of the public domain area will become a desert. Um, in fact, if not in name. Um, so this is 1938, a recognition that things are really, really bad, that we need science-based management, that we need to do something or else we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. So again, here's this um, story of the under, undercutting of the grazing service um, in response to this, President Truman creates the Bureau of Land Management by merging it with a much more powerful agency, the General Land Office, which was in charge of mining. Um, and, um, and so it was called the Bureau of Land Management. You can see their little, their little logo back in 1946 is, is, um, is miners. They didn't even really mention the grazing component. It was, it was hidden away. And... Um, but over the years, the Bureau became known really as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining um, because that's, that's what they were about. Um, so, you know, a change in direction, right? 1960s and 1970s is when, when most of our um, fundamental environmental laws were passed. Um, you know, here's just kind of a quick list that's, that's omitting a lot. You know, there was a lot more that happened during this time period, but these are kind of some of the big ones that applied to public lands grazing. Um, in 1964, you know, there was still a recognition that things were pretty terrible on the range. Nothing had changed. In fact, it had probably gotten considerably worse still. Um, so we had this Public Land Law Review Commission and, um, and they passed a multiple use act um, for the BLM. There was already one passed for the Forest Service in 1960. We got one for the BLM in 1964. We also got the Wilderness Act in 1964, which as many of you know, allowed livestock grazing to continue. That was the big deal that was made to get the Wilderness Act to pass. 
was uh, exempting livestock grazing. And today we still have lots and lots of livestock grazing occurring in wilderness, um, largely unregulated and, and causing all sorts of ecological destruction. Um, in the later 60s, we got the National Environmental Policy Act. Then in the 70s, the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrow Act, Endangered Species Act. Um, and then we get to the ones that really, that really affect the BLM and the grazing program the Federal Land Policy and Management Act and the Public Rangeland Improvement Act. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those two. Um, also, you'll notice the BLM adopted a new logo in 1964. They took the miners off the picture, um, but they, they sure didn't put the cows back on there either. Um, you know, this is a pretty nice looking landscape. Uh, not much BLM ever or currently looks like this picture. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, this is known as FLIPMA. Um, you know, the first thing that this law did was establish that public lands be retained in federal ownership. Now that was a big part of the battle. Um, back even before the, the Taylor Grazing Act, there was an effort to turn all of these grazing lands over to the states um, because they were in such poor condition. I think, uh, you know, Herbert Hoover's opinion was, let's just give it to the states. Why should we deal with this? Um, you know, fortunately, some other folks stood up and said, no, let's not do that. Let's keep them in federal ownership. Um, and, but it was really still unsettled uh, in law at that time. There was still a lot of talk about divestiture of public lands and the, and the give, sale of public lands. FLIPMA really put that to bed um, in large part and created a process that, um, that made it much harder to, to dispose of public lands, you know, with the exception of Alaska, where a lot of BLM lands that were public lands were then transferred to the, to the state and some to tribes. Um, you know, it also, FLIPMA uh, contained the direction to maintain an inventory of public lands. Um, that was what uh, was mentioned earlier, the, the PREA direction, we'll get to PREA later, but that first came up in FLIPMA, this idea that we should know what's going on on the lands, know what they are. Um, established land use and resource management planning. So this is, this is the law that basically created the process that gave us resource management plans that said, we're gonna plan at a landscape level for how we manage these lands. Um, it didn't repeal the Taylor Grazing Act, even though it repealed about 350 other laws. Uh, this FLIPMA left the Taylor Grazing Act in place, um, even though it created some law for grazing administration, largely still we're left with a system that, that says that livestock use is the, highly, is the most valuable use of these lands, that they're still chiefly valuable for grazing. And we're gonna throw some other regulations on top of that. But in the background here, it's all still about grazing. Um, so FLIPMA didn't fix that. Um, and we did get a, um, some language about preventing unnecessary and undue degradation of the lands and, um, and preventing permanent impairment of the lands. Um, these have not really been applied to livestock grazing so much. Um, unnecessary undue degradation has been applied to some mining operations. Um, I think that there still, still is applicable to grazing. At the time, it was certainly meant to be applicable to grazing. It hasn't been used that way, um, but it is part of the law. So important thing to keep in mind uh, as we kind of look at where we are today. So PREA, Public Rangelands Improvement Act. Um, this was kind of an amazing piece of legislation in a lot of ways, because it begins by Congress declaring that vast segments of the public lands are in an unsatisfactory condition. This is kind of one of the first pieces of legislation to just flat out say, things are really terrible out there and it's largely due to grazing. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's what Priya did in, in 1978 or, and, um, and it was based on a report actually from 1977 that assessed the condition of the lands and, and found that most of them were in an unsatisfactory condition. So Congress actually put that into the law. Um, and even saying again, that if we don't do something and, and, and put some energy and money into this, it's gonna get worse. Um, you know, that's, 
I think, a really important message. But here we are again, 1978, kind of repeating the same message from 1934. Um, you know, we, we've gone and now a good 40 plus years readily admitting that livestock are damaging these public rangelands, and yet we still don't have a process to, to really fix it or do anything about it. And there's still not enough money going into it, into, into these landscapes. Um, some things that Priya did that were positive, um, you know, it definitely strengthened those inventory provisions of FLIPMA and required condition analysis. FLIPMA didn't actually talk about the condition of the land. And we've seen how that's that's been kind of abused or neglected. Um, but again, it, it's in the law. It's in a law that pertains to livestock grazing. Um, it's it's amazing to think that later when they satisfy the, the uh, requirements of the law, livestock grazing would be excluded. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what happened. One of the big things Priya did was clearly state that grazing can be discontinued either temporarily or permanently to improve the conditions of public rangelands. So this is, this is a law that says the secretary can just end grazing uh, if, if, they're, if it's in order to improve the conditions of these public lands. Um, it's within the authority of this administration and everyone passed to have reduced or ended livestock grazing to protect these lands. Uh, it really has never been, hardly ever been done, but they do have the authority. Um, Reestablished a grazing fee formula, um, which was supposed to be temporary, and we would get a new formula that would that would get us to market rate. Um, even though there were two studies done to come up with a new formula, uh, none was ever put into place. And Ronald Reagan created an executive order in 1986 to make Priya's temporary formula permanent, which is why grazing still today, uh, ranchers pay a fee of a dollar thirty-five per cow-calf pair per month to graze on public lands. Even when we have a recognition that the agency does not have enough money to manage these lands. Um, you know, to just the story of the money would take an entire, you know, 20, 30 minute presentation. So just leave it at the, to say that, that they spend about at least 10 to 12 times more to administer the range program than the fees bring in currently. And those are just direct costs of administration. Um, so the, the grazing fee is not, the, the users of these lands are not paying for, the, for what they're getting. Um, you know, in the late 80s and 90s, things are still pretty bad out there. Um, members of Congress started asking the Government Accountability Office to look into to our public lands again in the grazing program. And we got a whole slew of reports. And these are all um, these are all links, so when the slides are available later, you can click on these. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of reports that are all looking at how the public lands are managed, how the BLM is doing, what the impacts of grazing on these landscapes are. And, and they were pretty honest in, in large part. You know, they identified that, that the lands were in poor condition that the agency couldn't manage them, that they didn't have the capability or capacity to, to do it properly. Um, you know, with regard to hot desert grazing, the recommendation was simply to stop doing it, um, that it was an inappropriate place for livestock. Um, you know, here, I think, you know, this, this kind of sums it up in a lot of cases. You know, this is the, one of the reports from 1992. Uh, regardless of the aspect of the, program being analyzed. The findings have been consistent. We found that because important range land management tasks are not being performed, um, BLM is hampered in its ability to protect the rangelands from damage by ongoing grazing activity and to restore lands damaged by previous activity. In every report, we've pointed out that the BLM has insufficient funding and staff to do all the work that needs to be done. Um, you know, here we are again saying the same things over and over and over again. You know, 1992 now, the rangelands are in terrible condition. The agency in charge with managing them isn't doing a very good job at it. They don't have the resources or the capacity to do it. Um, and, and again, here we are, you know, that now we're, now we're nearly 50 years after the, or 60 years after the passage of the Taylor Grazing Act. 
nothing has really changed. You know, I think this is one of the findings that is good to take uh, take real close stock of. You know, to achieve this objective, Congress may wish to consider reducing the scope of the existing grazing program, thereby reducing BLM's range management responsibilities. So if they don't have enough money, if Congress doesn't give them enough money to do it, or they're failing to manage the program, maybe we should cut back and have a program that, that is manageable. Um, you know, obviously that hasn't happened because we still have 22,000 grazing allotments and, and, um, and 155 million acres of, of BLM lands being grazed by livestock. You know, what this led to under the Clinton administration and Bruce Babbitt, the Secretary of the Interior at the time, um, was Rangeland Reform 94. Um, you know, at the time, and all, there were there were actually the, the folks that were kind of really pushing for this. Uh, some of some of some of them are you. Um, were back in in the early 90s with you know chanting slogans like "Cal Free" in '93. Um, you know, there was a lot of hope that that um, that things would change, that Bruce Babbitt would come in and and shake things up, and and they did to some extent with Rangeland, you know, reform in '94 but not nearly as much as what was proposed. Um, you know, it was supposed to also, again, get us to a market rate grazing fee uh, that got shelved. This was all supposed to apply to the Forest Service. The EIS they did was for the BLM and the Forest Service. Um, by the time they actually uh, issued a final decision, the Forest Service shelved it and just said, well, we're just, we're just not gonna do it. We just, we're just, you know, even though this was all analyzed and we have all this process for us, we're just gonna we're just gonna put that on the shelf, um, and still the Forest Service has no grazing regulations per se, um, but the BLM does um, largely because of rangeland reform. We got new grazing regulations in 95, 1995. Um, they got rid of those grazing advisory boards and replaced them with resource advisory councils. What seemed like a good idea, but are really still captured by industry in large part. Um, but um, but certainly better than those, those advisory boards. Um, one of the things that just came up recently in a court case that the 95 grazing regs did was separate the grazing preference, which is established by the Taylor Grazing Act, saying that you know, whoever's grazing has the preference to continue doing it essentially forever. Um, it separated that from the permit or lease. Um, so we just had a case recently where the rancher lost their permit for poor, for, non-compliance um, and that also made the preference go away um, where previously they may have been able to have argued that they would keep the preference and still be able to graze or, or sell it or give it to somebody else. Uh, the BLM now can say, well, no, the preference is gone. You have no control anymore uh, because you didn't uh, um, comply with the permit. Um, Rangeland reform also um, expanded public input, supposedly, to all interested parties for all grazing decisions. Decision is the key word, um, because as, uh, as I'll get to kind of at the end, if we have time, there are very few grazing decisions still being made. Um, so the public really doesn't have much of an opportunity to be involved, but, but that was supposed to have changed. Um, permittees didn't have title of their infrastructure anymore. And, um, and we were supposedly creating these conservation use permits. They tried to do that. Uh, unfortunately, the Supreme Court overturned that. Um, so we don't have an opportunity to, to, um, for permittees to just say, I'm not gonna graze it. You know, it just shouldn't be grazed. Let's put this in conservation use. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this because we've put up this slide a few times, I think in each of our presentations. The fundamentals of rangeland health were one of the biggest things that came out of rangeland reform in 94. This idea that, that there would be standards and guidelines and they would be across all BLM lands and that we would actually measure them and, and assess the condition of the lands based on these standards and guidelines. Um, you know, so unfortunately it still wasn't until 2001 now that we got a handbook for how to implement the, these uh, fundamentals of rangeland health at the BLM. So years still went by without really any direction about what to do with this, with this new policy. Um, so this is handbook H4180-1, um, which unfortunately I think a lot of 
people that even work for the BLM doesn't even know exists um, because they certainly aren't following it um, to a large extent. Um, but in the handbook, it said some kind of interesting things. It, it said that, you know, the purpose of the standards and guidelines is to, you know, provide a measure, a standard to determine land health and methods to improve the health of the public rangelands. Success will be measured in concrete outcomes in the lands we manage. Our job is to maintain the health of the land and make appropriate changes. And this was actually underlined in their text on the ground. So this was supposed to translate to changes in management uh, where land health standards are not being achieved. So 1994 to the present, this is still, these are still the regulations in place. Um, you know, these are, these are more current pictures. I showed you the ones from 1930s. Um, here's, what it, here's what a lot of our public lands look like today. Um, the vast majority of BLM offices don't follow the direction provided in the, in the Fundamentals of Rangeland Health Handbook. There's primary causes are really mostly a lack of will and a lack of resources, not enough money, not enough staff. Um, there's no accountability measures in place to ensure compliance with the regulations and the policies. So if a field manager or, or, uh, or a range con decides not to do this, there's, there's no consequence, nothing happens. They just don't do it. Um, so Josh, can we wrap up here pretty soon? Yeah, I will, I will get it done pretty quick here. Um, you know, it's important to note these parts. There's no accountability. Um, I can't really say that enough. There's no accountability for the staff, for their managers, for the state directors to ensure that the rangelands are in this improperly functioning condition. Um, and even when they do make the, the assessments, um, the management is rarely, changes to management are rarely implemented, like Laura mentioned. Um, just very briefly, there's compounding problems. This map here just shows how much of the public rangelands don't have new NEPA analysis. The National Environmental Policy Act is not being used to look at, at the condition or management of these grazing allotments. Almost you know, more than half of allotments and nearly two thirds of the AUMs on public lands are, are being rubber stamped every 10 years. So the same management continues regardless of the condition of the lands, even if they've done a, a rangeland health assessment, nothing changes in the permits. Uh, that was enshrined by Congress in, in 2014 as a, as a tool the BLM could use to renew permits. Um, just really quickly looking at Peter's data here, land health data, um, you get, whoops, let's see, uh, maybe I don't have time for that anyway, but um, yeah, let's see if I can just, uh, skip ahead here. You know, this is just showing all these allotments that overlap. So the ones that have the worst land health evaluations, those are the ones that also don't have NEPA or the ones that were never assessed. You know, so you can kind of see the overlap there. It's almost 100% consistency. Um, same thing with drought, you know, like this is, I think, really important. This will be the last one I'll show. Um, and then we can go to the, to the question section. But um, you know, this is the current drought map. This is this is like drought conditions as of today. Um, you know, and here's the here's the allotments that have don't have any assessments, and also are probably failing land health standards. And it's quite obvious that um, that there's a, a major overlap. You know, the areas that are in severe, extreme, or exceptional drought conditions are also failing land health standards and don't have any process for new management. You know, we can talk about these in the discussion part, but just to throw them up there real quick, these are the things that just a, a quick list of things that the BLM could be doing and Congress could be doing. <coughs> Immediate things they need to do is tell all the managers to follow the handbook. Just do the assessments, do them the way that they're supposed to do them. Um, they should be requiring reductions immediately in all areas with severe to exceptional drought conditions. We need automatic reductions today um, to keep those lands from being permanently degraded. We have to have an inventory 
that's publicly available. Uh, a private citizen shouldn't be doing this work for the BLM. They should be doing this work and they should make it publicly available. And they have to have, um, they have to have audits, independent audits of their work because we just simply can't trust the people on the ground right now to do the work and do it correctly and come up with, with assessments and, and solutions that are really gonna make the change. They've had you know, nearly 80 years to do it and it still isn't happening. Um, so we really need some independent audits and more accountability and we need changes in the law. You know, that's, that's, that's the next step. We need to change the laws, change the direction of this agency to manage for ecological outcomes and repeal the Taylor Grazing Act and, and get rid of this idea that these lands are chiefly valuable for livestock grazing. You know. So, you know, what is our legacy for future generations? We do have a choice and uh, we need to make some changes right away. Thank you, Josh. That was great. A lot of knowledge there. Okay, so Patrick Kelly is our <laughs> Idaho director, and he's going to be taking us through the question and answers. So why don't you go ahead, Patrick, and start asking those questions. Okay, thanks, Adam. And thank you to Laura, uh, Josh, and Peter for some great presentations. Um, I learned a lot today, um, and I work in this field, so. <laughs> Um, so I'll start off uh, with uh, a question that came through for Peter. Um, the questioner is asking, has there been a similar assessment or evaluation for Forest Service lands uh, in the same context as, as the BLM uh, assessment that you presented? Is, is Peter around? Yes. Okay. Oh, there he is. Was on mute. Um, as far as I know, um, no, but there are, uh, I do have data about watershed condition um, done by the Forest Service and overlaid those on top of the, uh, the uh, allotments. And often Forest Ser Ser Service lands will be uphill. And so we'll fill in a lot of the gaps. And so it, it does provide an interesting look. And I could certainly provide that. Um, I could add that layer, for example, to the peer site, so that folks can, can see the um, the adjacency within the same watershed, what the, the condition class is of Forest Service uh, upstream from uh, BLM lands. I don't know if they are compatible. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Someone asks, uh, is there any way to differentiate uh, diff impacts from wild horses from the more numerous livestock since essentially all legal wild horses areas also permit livestock grazing? Yeah, and that's, and that's something that um, um, I had actually um, elsewhere in the presentation that I didn't get quite through. But yeah, so the vast majority of, um, of those allotments that identify wild horses as a, a significant cause of failure, also identify livestock. So there are very few that, that identify just wild horses alone or wild horses, not livestock. And this, this the issue of separating um, damage due to various ungulates came up in the REAs as well and was justification for excluding livestock grazing, bringing up the fact that the you know, diff differences between um, livestock, wild horses, um, elk, deer, and uh, pronghorn um, would be difficult to, dif to differentiate. And so that was used as uh, in the discussions early on for a reason um, that to deal with grazing livestock, you had to do all the rest. However, the data, the, the data show collectively um, that, uh, that um, more than 70% of failures identify livestock grazing as a significant cause and just a fraction of those wild horse and burrow and almost, well, no, no pronghorn clearly. There were more, there were more um, uh, prairie dogs sighted, for example, in some of the native ungulates. So. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, let's say, let's move on to another one. Um, 
Laura, this is kind of for you. It's a, a rangeland uh, question. Someone's wondering what annual grasses are increasing as these lands degrade. Uh, yeah, um, that was from Roger, it wasn't better. Um, and I, I kind of answered him. But what I said was, I mean, what I see when I go out there is um, in, in the more, uh, you know, the cooler areas, you know, cheatgrass is, is the big guy in the room. Um, in, the, in, the, as, in the lower, you know, the warmer elevations, then um, I, I see red brome increasing and uh, schismus in some places, um, also lower down. Lots of Forbes, weighty Forbes as well. Okay, thanks, Laura. And I, I just, uh, I'm going to throw in a question here for myself and cheat, but this is for Josh primarily. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that need to happen in terms of enforceability and other strategies to get these things to change. Does that look like uh, litigation to you? Does it look like new statutory, you know, uh, bills passed in Congress or what, what's the avenue here to get the BLM to essentially follow the law and, and do their jobs? That's a big question, I really. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all of the above. You know, I think I think we're gonna have to look at, at potential litigation, you know, where we know that the agency has, has the data, knows that an allotment has failed. Um, you know, they're required to take action before the next grazing season. Um, in a lot of cases, nothing happens. You know, Laura mentioned that we sued once before in in Utah on that, and um, and just had a bad judge. Um, but you know, the facts are still the facts, and and I think we'll we'll see what comes of that. Um, in terms of accountability, you know, within the agency, I think there's a lot of opportunity. The BLM uh, says that they're going to be putting out new grazing regulations um, next, sometime this year or next year. Um, and that's an opportunity for sure to um, to strengthen the fundamentals of rangeland health, to add um, additional measures, but especially to add accountability. Um, they can definitely um, add accountability both for the permittees and for the managers um, through those regulations. And and they can also subsequently look at at some of how they manage personnel and do and do um, performance evaluations for staff. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense that somebody with 80% or 77% of the allotments they manage failing to meet land health standards due to livestock grazing, the thing that they manage um, has no consequences. And, and usually those are the folks that get promoted and end up being the state director. Um, so it's, it, it's completely backwards, you know, like if it was private industry and you're and you were doing such a poor job of managing your resources, you would lose your job. Um, and I, I think there needs to be some accountability for the people who are in charge of managing these lands in that way. And I think the BLM can do that internally. Um, Congress can certainly do it, too, um, and they could tie it to the agency's funding, um, I, which I think would be would be a good opportunity. Um, the agency needs more money to hire more people. Um, they need more money to hire more people with professional backgrounds in the, in, the, um, in the sciences they need to manage these lands. We need more botanists. We need more people with ecology degrees. We need more qualified hydrologists. We need more wildlife biologists at these agencies. Um, and in positions of power and in positions of authority to make decisions. And, um, and you know, those, those people demand higher salaries because they have professional degrees too. So, so we need money to pay them um, and keep them in those jobs for a long term as well. Um, Congress can do that, but then they can put those accountability measures in place when they, when they appropriate that money. So, so yeah, it, we, we all have a role to play. We as the watchdogs, um, the agency to, to just get their ship straight and, uh, and Congress to, to kind of play the role of, of oversight as well as the power of the purse. I have a question for Josh. Um, the Public Rangelands Improvement Act, how come we don't hear much about that in more detail and has enforcement ever been um, successfully implemented through litigation? 
It's interesting. The Public Rangeland Improvement Act is kind of interesting because sections of it expired and other sections remain. So it, it had kind of like, a lot of it had to do with, with um, range improvement funding and those sections of it expired. Um, and the grazing fee section also kind of expired. It was a pilot program. Um, so it doesn't really apply anymore in terms of the grazing fee because there's this executive order that, that replaced it. Um, so I think those two things were, were the things that a lot of people focused on with that with that law. Um, and, and a lot of what's in there is in the is in the regulations now. So so it's not so much that we that we sue based on a violation of of the Public Rangeland Improvement Act. It's it's in the regulations. You know, the Rangeland Reform 94 and the regulations that came from it um, incorporate a lot of what's what's was in that law. Um, so it's there. It's just kind of, um, I think the, the main thing that to me is so important about it is, is just how honest it was <laughs> about how bad things were and, and why. And, um, and it, looking back, that was 1978 and nothing has changed. In fact, in some cases, it's probably worse. Any more questions on there, Patrick? Uh, we're. I think we're just about out of them. Um, someone was inquiring if anybody can answer how many actual grazing permit holders exist today. Anybody has those numbers? It's a, sure. Well, it's it's hard to know. I mean, Peter, you may have better data than me, but but what happens is that like a lot of these are holding companies with a different name. So you would actually have to look at who owns the business to know like if it's the same permittee, the same you know business that has multiple permits in some cases. Um, so it's confusing, and it would take a lot of a lot of digging to to really count them all out. One of the things I might uh, add to that though is um, you do see a lot of like um, uh, husband wife or kids or uh, ones that are that clearly appear to be some corporate. Uh, but also just looking at addresses, um, there, there are a lot of addresses in states that um, uh, have no BLM allotments in them. Uh, they're including uh, Washington, D.C., Florida, all the way up to Maine and Vermont, all the Midwest. Um, so I'd be curious to know whether those folks are on the ground, whether they're just um, they're they're uh, <laughs> using someone else's base property and, and the fact that they are have, are no way involved actually in uh, making a living off that land. Actually, the controversy we had in Northeast Oregon with the frozen cattle, um, that guy was traced back to somewhere in the Southwest. So that would be another good data project for you, Pete. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, you know, I think, if people want to raise their hands and, and ask a question, we can open it up to that. So if you go down to reactions and then uh, if you hit the raise hand button, we can actually take some verbal questions here. Uh, we won't take it much past, I don't know, 8.15 or so. So another 10 minutes, we'll wrap it up. But if people want to speak, please raise your hand. I'll address one real quick I did see in the chat, which was about the costs um you know like what what is it what are the programs cost you know the gao did a report in 2014 that said that the cost of the grazing program to it just direct administration is about 144 million dollars and they bring in about 12 million dollars in fees per year so the agencies spend 144 million dollars um, on administrative costs and bring in 12 million dollars in fees um, that go back to the treasury um, the Center for Biological Diversity did a report in 2015 that looked at, at associated costs. Uh, the, the report's called Costs and Consequences. Um, you can Google it and find it. Um, they, they came up with a number closer to half a billion dollars in annual costs from grazing when you add in um, on public lands, when you add in things like wildlife services and all the killing of predators um, when you add in uh, endangered species, you know, we have like, 
in a lot of the Southwest, about two thirds of the species listed on the endangered species list are, are there uh, with a causal factor of livestock grazing. Um, so we have a lot of, a lot of work uh, to restore lands that are degraded by grazing that don't get accounted for in the budget of the grazing program um, and are, are listed elsewhere. So it, it's costing taxpayers a fortune to continue doing this on public lands. And, the, and the, you know, even recently there was a study about the, um, the social cost of carbon for livestock grazing. It just came out, right? It said it's $36 uh, per AUM is the cost to, to taxpayers, the carbon cost of having cows on public lands. They pay $1.35 an AUM to, to put the cows out there. And it costs us $36 an AUM in, uh, you know, in the carbon accounting metrics. Um, so that's, that's kind of astounding. And, um, and another reason why we need to rein this in. Okay, well, we'll wrap it up. If you would consider making a donation to Western Watersheds Project, you can head over to westernwatersheds.org. And we might be wrapping up the webinars for the season. Uh, give everyone a chance to go outside and enjoy the nice weather and give WWP a chance to go out into the field. So we'll wrap it up there. Patrick, Laura, Josh, Peter, thanks so much for uh, all your great presentations and help tonight. And everyone have a good evening. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam.